kingdom built on the profits of its oil reserves. This tiny emirate, the size of the state of Rhode Island, is one of the richest places in the Arab world. Singapore is a small, open economy, a city-state with no natural resources. kingdom built on the profits of its oil reserves. This tiny emirate, the size of the state of Rhode Island, is one of the richest places in the Arab world, but it hasn't always been like this. Fifty years ago, Dubai was a trading town built on a creek. Over half a century later, it's been transformed. Now it's famous for gold, trade, and oil. Too long ago, Singapore was a very different place. I think one of the little known facts about Singapore is, is that it's one of the very few developing countries that has actually made the transition from developing to developed uh, status and all in the space of 30 to 40 years. The Crown Prince, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, has a two billion dollar plan to save his country. He's ordered his kingdom to transform itself into the world's number one luxury tourist destination. And the Crown Prince has a history of getting what he wants. I would say Singaporeans are very proud of their country. They are amazed at their own prosperity. So I think we have reached a stage when there is genuine admiration, gratitude to the government for giving us what um, it, has, it has. Can, can Jamaicans expect accelerated levels of growth, uh, much faster levels of growth than the average 1% you managed in your 18 and a half years in office? In Trinidad, the government got a basket of fair water in 2007. Key economic indicators over the last six to 12 months have shown us that Jamaica has achieved some level of stability. Inflation has been held at single digit levels. Interest rates have come down to 30 or 40 year lows. And the currency has been stable for more than a year. For the first time in 
more than 20 years, there is at least a base of stability from which we can move forward to grow the economy. What is most interesting with the JLP as well, if you look through the budget, the most significant increase towards any kind of spend is towards juvenile centers. And they've increased that to over 500 million to 800 million dollars. They're spending more money to lock up young people than they are to train them. They're spending more money to lock up young people than they are to train them. The debt was 950 billion. Now it has grown to 1.6 trillion, an increase of almost 70%. Finance Minister Dr. Peter Phillips left the island today for Boston, New York and London to meet with representatives of investment banks and other financial institutions. He's looking to raise funds on the international capital market to finance the upcoming budget. And while one local financial analyst believes the minister will be successful, there's one particular matter of concern. They are looking to raise some 500 million US dollars on the international capital market. His concern, however, is the rate at which the country will be able to secure these funds. With the U.S. economy showing signs of recovery, the analyst says interest rates could be on the rise again. You know, it seems like we, we, we need the money to, to close the fiscal gap um, that we're projecting because of the payments that's coming up. Speaking of IMF, the multilateral has revised growth targets downwards for the country recently. Go One actually cannot get away with borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. When I'm returned to power as Prime Minister, I will ensure the strengthening of these institutions like the Office of the Contractor General and all the institutions having to investigate corruption and deal with corruption when they are reported. 
Yet another battle royale is shaping up between the contractor general and the administration. This time, it surrounds the move by the Transport and Works Minister Dr. Omar Davies to set up what he describes as an independent panel to oversee infrastructure works on the north-south link of Highway 2000. That decision of the minister did not escape the attention of Mr. Christie, who is in Georgetown, Guyana, for the funeral of his father. According to him, it's a death knell for the anti-corruption fight. Regarding the panel, he said, the three men cannot usurp the function of the OCG. Greg Christie also made this declaration. The rhetoric of Portia Simpson Miller about a tough stance against corruption has not been matched with the practice now that she's Prime Minister. I guess they didn't expect anyone would ask questions, look at the depth of what they're trying to say. On, I think it is Wednesday, and it's after as an here, that we will launch just one small part of G. We will be creating jobs for about 700 persons starting in how many parishes? How much? Seven parishes we will be starting where 700 persons will shortly be put to work. We had pressed the State Minister for Transport, Works and Housing about several aspects of the program, such as how will the persons for the program be selected, when will other aspects of Jeep, such as the agricultural component, be rolled out, and where is the funding to come from for several other aspects of the program. For those and other answers, it's the Prime Minister to whom the nation must look. I am going to leave all of that for the PM on Wednesday. All right, so the PM will talk about that. Yes. It's Carlson Muda who has taken direct aim at the program. His response, no more than a rebranding of an existing program initiated by the previous government under an IDB loan for a comprehensive road maintenance program. All goes according to plan. The government's jobs program, Jeep, will be launched Thursday afternoon on Barbican Road in St. Andrew. A cloud of controversy, however, will hang over any such launch. After notable stallings, work came Monday that individuals were being employed under the program. The revelation sparked a visit by officials of the OCG to the Transport Works and Housing Ministry's Maxfield Road offices Tuesday, where it seized documents related to the program. Among the items it took was a confidential memo from the Permanent Secretary, Audrey Sewell, to the Minister, Dr. Omar Davies. In the memo dated March 20, Ms. Sewell said she was concerned about what she called a lack of information to her about the program. She noted that she was written by the OCG requesting information, however, she was in no position to provide Greg Chris's office with such. What's more, she expressed to the Minister that she only learned of Thursday's launch and the planned allocation of $10 million to each constituency via the media. Ms. Sewell wrote, quote, I am requesting that I be advised as soon as possible whenever decisions are taken about the program, especially as they relate to expenditure, since they have implications for procurement, end quote. The OCG said the permanent secretary had outlined similar concerns to it in an interview. On Tuesday, Dr. Davies admitted to CVM News that not all public officials had a full knowledge of Jeep. believe if Jeep is going to be successful, then there must be a greater level of public education. Um, that is sadly lacking now. Um, even us here as the people's representatives, in some instances, still remain in the dark.
the People's National Party remain focused on people power. It is seen in the delivery during the 18 years of new schools built, new hospitals built, new community centers built. This tiny Southeast Asian island has made the move from third world status to first. It's now undergoing one of the world's largest ever subway expansions. A mighty challenge, given that they're tunneling underneath a bulging metropolis. It's confronted transport chaos by creating a public transport system with no equal. By 2010, there will be a subway stop every 400 meters throughout most of the island. Its mass transit system is now one of the crowning jewels of Singapore, moving over one million people every day. Singaporeans are master planners. They prepare for everything. Several stations are completely built. The trains won't stop there for another seven years. They just like to be ready. one of the most daring engineering projects the world has ever seen. A massive island built from sand and rock. With threats of earthquakes, violent storms, and erosion from the sea, it'll be a miracle if this Palm megastructure survives. August 2001. The Persian Gulf is a massive activity. Dubai is building one of the biggest man-made islands in the world. Engineers have a daunting task ahead of them because this is a construction like no other. All structures stand in defiance of nature. Most are built from concrete and steel, materials that are artificially strengthened. But this massive island is being constructed out at sea, using only natural materials, sand and rock. And both start eroding the moment they hit the water. For project manager Bob Berger, it's a daunting task. Mr. Simpson Miller, your party is resting a great deal of its economic and social programs, should it come to office, on the renegotiation of several agreements, including with the IMF, the Chinese over JDIP, and the Jamaica Public Service. How long do you believe it would take to complete those negotiations, and what would happen to the country in the interim? I intend for it to happen within between our first and second week in government. It will not take long. We have a very good relationship with, for example, China. I come with 17 years of experience as a minister of government and then for a short time prime minister. My track record is there. I am tested and I am proven. This is Majestic Gardens, popularly called Bakto. Like many other inner-city communities, Majestic Gardens has its fair share of challenges. 
there is evidence of very poor infrastructure all around. Webs of illegal electrical connections crisscross the community. The need for proper housing is all too evident. Many live on unsatisfactory conditions and the slightest sign of rain triggers fear. But they're hopeful. They're banking their hopes on their member of parliament, Prime Minister Portia Simpson Miller. Well, infrastructure, we're Prime Minister working on that now. As you can see, if you want to take a picture of the houses, these are here from about in the 60s. We have development up at the top. Down the bottom here, just start to develop now because she start from development when she was in power for one year and it was stopped because she was out of power. I have the ability and the skills and my experience brought me to a number of international meetings, having to meet with international leaders, from prime ministers to presidents, to king. Move over Greece. Jamaica wants a bailout just like the one you got. Jamaican Prime Minister Portia Simpson Miller says her Caribbean island nation would welcome a rescue package as part of a new loan agreement it's negotiating with the IMF. Quote, if they could give a bailout like Greece, Lord have mercy, you would see Jamaica grow and flourish. Jamaica's debt burden is 126% of GDP, making it by that measure the eighth most indebted country in the world. I Jamaica is not the basket case that Greece is. Their expected GDP this year is 2.4%, up from 1.4 last year. The government has already committed to raising taxes, cutting pensions. They have the same issue Greece does, Greece does getting people to pay those taxes. And they only want $1.27 billion. Yeah, and they, they, and they said that they don't want to take austerity. The Prime Minister, in fact, told the Bloomberg News reporter that interviewed her that they don't want to take austerity because it would harm local efforts to crack down on drug gangs, which is a big problem in Jamaica. Ten percent of its economy is tourism. But isn't that what you, the price you pay in exchange for a bailout? Bailout in exchange for austerity. That's how it's working in Greece. That's how well, it's working I, I in was, the rest of the EU. She was referring to the free lunch. The right. Oh, free money. I, I mean, if, Listen, if it's free, I'll take a bailout who, too. Who doesn't want it? So Jamaica and so many other countries are saying, hey, how about some love for us? I feel that way. What's your debt to GDP level? <laughs> oh, goodness. Meanwhile, the Chamber of Commerce President also weighed in on celebrations to mark Jamaica's 50th year since independence. Mr. Simuda is warning that while the country celebrates, Jamaicans should not be blinded by our failures over the years. He said the country has made several achievements of which we should be very proud. However, there have been moments which should cause us to hang our heads in shame. He said that 50, Jamaica is one of the lowest ranked and more unproductive Caribbean islands, with a murder rate in keeping with a country at civil war. All of those people having this historic dream that their descendants would live in a democracy that not only had political independence, but economic independence. And if anniversaries are supposed to be milestones not just of celebration, but of assessment, then by any assessment, we ought to be ashamed of where it is we are.